We are in Judges chapter 16 this morning. Judges chapter 16, we're going to read verses 1 through 3. Judges chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. For our text this morning, we'll read together, then after that I'll pray, and then we'll be seated. Judges chapter 16, starting in verse 1. Then went Samson to Gaza, and saw there an harlot, and went in unto her. Is everybody there? Because I feel like I'm the only one reading here. <laughs> Am I the only one reading here? Yeah. Y'all love to hear me, don't you? No. Uh, are we all there now? Okay, let's start again. Then went Samson to Gaza, and saw there an harlot, and went in unto her. And it was told the Gazites, saying, Samson has come hither. And they compassed him in, and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city, and were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. And Samson lay till midnight, and arose at midnight, and took the doors of the gate of the city, and the two posts, and went away with them, far and all, and put them upon his shoulders, and carried them up to the top of the hill that is before him. Let's pray. Lord, as we read through this passage of Scripture, we see a man who could have been great. And I know, Lord, a lot of people would consider him great. But reading this passage, we see yet another failure in his life. And we know, Lord, that this is an example for us to teach us that we also are prone to wonder. We also are prone to fail. But you've given us examples in your word to warn us that we would not commit those same kinds of mistakes. And so, Lord, today as I preach, Father, as I preach on this theme concerning Samson's dilemma and how, Lord, he had uh, disgraced your name because of his actions, that we'll take that to heart. Give me the power to preach. Make it very real to our lives. May thy spirit apply these lessons to our hearts. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. Samson's Dilemma. We have before us a very interesting character, Samson. He's a man that we would like to say is great. We speak of him as being the mightiest man in the world, powerful Samson with all his muscles, and yet a failure. The book of Judges is filled with fascinating stories of heroism, battles, and victories. Stories about people like Gideon and Gideon's fleece or Ehud, the left-handed judge who pulled his knife and killed Eglon, or Deborah and Barak, and how they uh, put, to, put to flight Jobin and, and the Canaanites. And we have these wonderful stories in the book of Judges. It's an incredibly fascinating and uh, exciting book to read through. But if you've ever really paid attention as you've read the book, you'll notice that the bulk of the message in the book of Judges is about failure. It's about struggle. It's about the sin of Israel. And it all comes about, their failure comes about as a result of their sin. So we find in the book of Judges, six cycles of sin, and then suffering, and then supplication, and then salvation. Six times the suffering that is brought about by the hand of God. Why does God do this? Take your Bibles, turn to Judges chapter 3. We're going to kind of do a quick review here in the book of Judges. But if you go back to Judges chapter 3 and you'll look at verses 8 and 9, notice what the passage says. It says, Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of Chushan Rishathaim, which, by the way, happens to be the longest name in the Bible. No, I don't think it is actually, but it's a long one. It could be longest. Yeah, somebody else look it up, okay? Chushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. I mean, I, I guess if you're from a country with a long name like Mesopotamia, mm -hmm. you've got to have a long name as a king, and he does. And the children of Israel served Chushan Rishathaim eight years. And when the children of Israel cried against the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them. <coughs> even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. So the Jews, what did they do? They had begun to intermarry with the heathen. As a result, they began to fall into idolatry. And so God brought them into bondage until they cried out for deliverance. And then when they did that, then God sends Othniel to deliver them. And you would think that you'd learned a lesson, right? But no, the Jews being slow learners as they were, and aren't we all, 
we begin to read again in Judges chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered under him the children of Ammon and Amalek, and went and smote Israel, and possessed the city of palm trees. That, that would be Jericho, by the way. And the city of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjaminite, a man left-handed. And by him, the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. They sent a present by the hand of... I like that. Anyway... So what happens here? Well, they fall into sin again, and now they go into slavery. So their first period of slavery was eight years. But now they go into their second period of slavery, and you have 18 years. Then what do they do? Well, their hearts are broken, and they cry out to God again. And again, God delivers them by sending Ehud. Ehud comes. But not long after Ehud dies, then they go right back to their sin again. Look at Judges chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Judges chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says, And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. Are you starting to get a pattern here? When Ehud was dead, and the Lord sold them into the hand of Jobin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, who dwelt in Harasheth, of the Gentiles. Now this time, they again go into oppression, and this time they're oppressed for 20 years. 20 years, and they finally cry out to God, and God again delivers them by using the prophetess, uh, the prophetess Deborah and Barak, who was at that time her military leader. And so things start to look better again, and you would think that they would have learned, but they don't. So things start looking good again, and then after a while we read this. Notice this in Judges chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. You starting to get this? And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens, which were in the mountains and caves and strongholds. Now this time, they're in bondage to the Midianites. And this time, they're in bondage for seven years. And to make matters worse, the Amalekites and the children of the east, the passage says, were also taking their crops and taking their livestock until there was really nothing left for them to eat. They're basically being oppressed and starved out. So what do they do? Well, the Jews cry out to God, of course. You know, they're flat on their back. they got nowhere to look but up like us. They cry out to God, and so the Lord sends a prophet who explains to them what's going on, and God wants them to understand. He wants them to clearly know it, that, that what's happening to them is a result of their sin. So God wanted to make sure they understood clearly, because apparently they're not getting it. So in Judges chapter 6, verses 6 through 10, we begin to read again. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, and it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, and I brought you forth out of the house of bondage. In other words, God says, Look, I freed you. I set you free. The very next verse, And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all that oppressed you, and drained them out from before you, and gave you their land. Now God's saying, I brought you here. I gave you victory. I gave you their land. I did everything for you. And then verse 10, And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But, don't you like those buts? That always means that there's a contrast, something's coming. But uh, you have not obeyed my voice. So now God says, I did all of this for you, but you didn't listen to me. The Lord told them. He did everything necessary, everything that needed to be done for them to be able to be free. But they, they disobeyed God's voice. And now they're in bondage again. Then God calls Gideon. 
And God uses Gideon to free the Israelites from their oppressors. And so the Jews, they want Gideon to be their leader. But Gideon declines. He says, no, not me. The Lord shall rule over you. You would think that they would get it, but they don't. After the death of Gideon, there are several other judges who ruled over Israel. You've got Abimelech and Tola and Jair. Until finally, about 50 years goes by, and the Jews, what do they do? They fall right back into sin again. And you're thinking, how could they do that? I don't know. How do we do that? And it usually doesn't take us 50 years. For some of us, it only takes us about 50 minutes. And we fall right back into sin. Again, it, it seems that the gods of the heathen were such a big attraction to them. And their, their hearts were turned away from the God of Israel again. And so we read in Judges chapter 10, in verses 6 through 9, it says this, The children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam and Ashtaroth, and the gods of Syria, and the gods of Sidon, and the gods of Moab, and the gods of the children of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and forsook the Lord, and served not him. So, everybody had their own God. It's like, yeah, I, I serve this God. Well, you do. Well, that's nice. I serve that God. But nobody was serving the God of Israel. They were all serving other gods. And the anger of the Lord, verse 7, was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines, and into the hands of the children of Ammon. And that year... They vexed and oppressed the children of Israel 18 years. All the children of Israel that were on the other side of Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. Moreover, the children of Ammon passed over Jordan to fight against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was sore distressed. You think you got stress? You, you may have stress. No, stress is no joke. But these guys are sore Distressed. So finally, the Jews cry out to God again. But this time, God's not helping them. Notice this. Judges chapter 10, verses 10 through 16. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and also served Balaam. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did not I deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and from the children of Ammon? And from the Philistines, the Zidonians also, and the Amalekites, and the Moanites did oppress you. And you cried to me, and I delivered you out of their hand, yet you have forsaken me, and served other gods. Wherefore, I will deliver you no more. Wow. How would you like it if God looked at you in the midst of your prayer of repentance and said, uh-uh, not this time. This is basically what he does to them. Verse 14. Go and cry unto the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee this day. And they put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord. And his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. You see, God never really wants his people to suffer. He never really wants us to go through oppression from the enemy. Sometimes he allows it to teach us. The Lord was grieved for the suffering of his people so that he, he allowed Jephthah, you've probably read about Jephthah, to wax strong against the Ammonites. And though he judged Israel for six years, the Jews were still plagued by their enemies. Even after six years of Jephthah. After <coughs> Jephthah comes Ibsen and Ellen and, and Abdon. These men judged Israel for a total of 25 years. So another 25 years goes by, and then... What do we read? Once again, in Judges chapter 13, in verse 1, what does the Bible say? And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. Are you getting the pattern here? And the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines. How long? 40, 40 years. 40, you'll find if you study scriptures, you'll find that 40 is sometimes symbolic of tribulation or judgment. I thought that was kind of interesting, you know, 40 years in the wilderness and that kind of thing. It's interesting, though, because at that time, the Scriptures doesn't say anything about the Jews crying out for deliverance. Not this time. But God is faithful. He will not allow His people to be extinguished. So what does He do? For a wicked and lukewarm people, He raises up a wicked and lukewarm judge, Samson, to deliver them from the Philistines. In every case, God sought to bring about repentance in them. 
so that his fellowship with his people could be restored. And that brings us up to our text, because Samson in Judges chapter 15 and verse 20, the very last verse there in Judges 15 and verse 20 says this, And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. Now Samson had his problems, he got things squared away. 20 years he judges Israel. We're told about it in one verse. Nothing's recorded about those 20 years, so we can assume that nothing significant really happened. Nothing bad, but then again, nothing substantially good either. Nothing, really. When I read that verse, I, I think of my life, and I think to myself, what have I done lately? What kind of impact have I made lately? What about your life? Have you done anything significant for God lately? We can assume that Samson's mediocre life, which is really what he had, and mediocre, spiritually speaking, I, you know, well, he was the strongest man on earth, and he did all these great things. Spiritually speaking, mediocre is about the best we can say for him. We can assume that his mediocre life was a major contribution to his later downfall. Christian, your mediocre walk with God will lead you to ruin. So I want us to consider three points in our text this morning. First in Judges chapter 16 and verse 1, notice the disgrace of Samson's compromise. In Judges chapter 16 and verse 1, it says, Then went Samson to Gaza, and saw there an harlot, and went in unto her. And I don't think I need to explain to you what that means. You're probably well aware of what that means. What does Samson do? He goes to Gaza. What's he doing there? Gaza, the, the, the word Gaza is an interesting word. It comes from a, a Hebrew root word, Oz. Not like the Wizard of Oz. This is A-Z, not O-Z. But it means strong or mighty or fierce. It also means rough. If you are following in your Bible in Proverbs 18, verse 23, Proverbs 18, verse 23, the Bible says, The poor useth entreaties, but the rich answereth roughly. The word roughly, there is a translation from that same root word. Gaza was a rough place. It was bad neighborhood. The kind of place that Samson probably shouldn't have been. Now, sometimes we can find ourselves in rough places on accident. But not Samson. He went there on purpose. Samson went to a rough place with premeditated sin in his heart. He goes down there to a rough place where he sees the harlot and he goes in unto her. Now those who want to live in sin usually have very few problems going to rough places. Those who don't mind having a mediocre Christian life, kind of a compromising Christian life, have no problem going to rough places in order to live their mediocre life. Rough places. What's a rough place? A place where sin is rampant. rampant. It's in your face. It's happening all around you. Places where you are openly exposed to depravity or drunkenness or desire. These are what we would term rough places. Christian, in order for you to feel comfortable in a rough place, if you will, you're going to have to quench the spirit. Silence the voice of the Holy Spirit in your life that is crying out to you saying, let's get out of here. It's bad for us to be here. You have to deny who you really are in order to get along in a rough place, in order to fit in in a rough place. You'll find yourself having to run to the same riot of excess as the lost. Gaza. Gaza was enemy territory, by the way. What was he doing there? Being in the enemy's camp will only lead you to disgrace. This is where Samson went. Christian, you and I both know that there are some rough places in this world. If you're kind of wondering what I'm talking about, let me name some things for you. Bars are rough places. There's a couple of reasons why they keep the lights down low in a bar. One is so that because men love darkness rather than light, right? Okay? It's a dark place and you can sit in there and get drunk and stupid if you want to while you're sitting in there and nobody can see you doing it. And maybe 
the people at the next table over won't recognize you. Or you get so drunk you can't realize that the person you're talking to that you're chatting up is, you know, uh, ugly as sin and you don't know it because you're in a dark place. There's all kinds of reasons why they keep the lights turned down low in a bar. Why? It's a rough place. You don't belong there. I can't make it any clearer than that. Bars. Drunken parties. Sometimes, you know, you go to work and they want to throw a party. and You know what's going to happen there. You know what's going to go on there. It's not like they're saying, hey, let's go bowling and have a pizza. No, they're saying, let's have a party. What do you think? They're going to drink milk? Seriously? It's a rough place. In other shadier parts of town, I think we all have a good idea what a rough place is supposed to look like. Christian, you should not be there. You don't belong there. You say, well, my house is right next door to that neighborhood. Fine. Go around the block if you have to. Do whatever you have to. If you make it a habit to go to those kind of places, it's just a matter of time before you will also fall in disgrace in your own private life. You know, some people like to speak of their freedom in Christ. And you might be sitting here thinking right now, well, I have freedom in Christ. Freedom as a believer. I have the power of the Holy Spirit. I have the liberty as a Christian. I am not bound by the Old Testament law. Yeah, have fun with that. I've never seen anyone yet who spoke on their liberty in Christ and it did not fall. Think about that. And I believe in liberty in Christ. But I also believe that there's something called common sense. And common sense tells me that I shouldn't be in places I don't belong. Common sense. Frequenting the enemy's territory is only going to get you in trouble. And if you, would, if you would be honest with yourself, you would have to at least admit that even if nothing ever happened to you, you're still affected. You still see things you shouldn't have seen. And it still has an impact on your life when you see all the things that's happening around you. Here's Samson. He goes to a rough place. He goes to enemy territory. And while he's there... The Bible says that he sees a harlot and he's overcome by his lust. And by the way, this is not the first time that Samson had problems with women. Men, in general, have problems with women. Samson really had a problem with women. This is not the first time for him. It got him in trouble before, and, and that was 20 years ago. And it seems like 20 years ago, he kind of got a grip on reality and got his life squared away. But now here he is, 20 years later... Maybe he thought he had it under control. Maybe he thought he was a real man now and he could handle his weakness. You know, I can handle it. I can do it and it won't bother me. But here he is in a moment of weakness and what does he do? He falls again. Folks, we live in this cursed flesh. You may be a child of God. And you may be saved, but your flesh is not redeemed yet. It is not redeemed. It is still wicked, and the, only the rapture or death will finally eradicate the possibility of temptation in your life. Until then, you're in your cursed flesh, and you will be tempted. The world is a temptation. It is a living, breathing, walking temptation. Samson had not overcome his weakness. He should have learned from his failures. And maybe he did. But here he is now, repeating them again. The biggest disgrace of this whole story well, maybe not the biggest, but one big disgrace of this whole story was that the Gazites knew he was there. They knew that he didn't belong there. They knew he shouldn't have been in that situation. But there he is, and they knew what he was doing. Here he is. He's supposed to be a mighty judge of Israel. But now he's acting just like one of the certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. One of the low lowlifes, if you will. It's always sad. To me, it's always sad when a believer falls into compromise. It's even sadder when he becomes a bad example of what Christianity is all about to the lost. I hate to see it. What happens, if you ever ask yourself the question, what happens when a believer decides to live in sin? What happens besides the fact that your fellowship with God is broken? Some other things happen. This is what the world sees. First of all, you are shaming the name of Christ. Well, he says that Jesus could free him from sin, but look at him now. You shame the name of Christ. Secondly, you shame your church. Uh, look, if you are going to live a mediocre Christian life, don't tell anybody where you go to church. I don't want them all to think that we're all like you. Okay? Uh, if you're going to go out there and, and be dumb, don't tell them you go to the haven. we got a great te testimony in this community. I'd like to keep that. All right? So if you're going to act like a nut, if you're going to act like the world, 
Well, then don't tell them you're part of the haven. Simple. I mean, you probably want to keep your mouth shut about it anyway, right? The third thing I notice is you make it a whole lot harder for the rest of us who want to witness, who want to tell about Jesus, who want people to know that Christ makes a difference, and you're trying to tell them, and then what do they do? They say, well, I know so-and-so. They did this and that. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but I have. I've been in situations where somebody threw a church member's name in my face and said, they're doing this, and they're doing that. Let's move on to Judges 16 and verse 2, where we see the danger of Samson's compromise in Judges 16 and verse 2. And it was told to Gazite, saying, Samson is come hither. And they compassed him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night, saying, in the morning when it is day, we shall kill him. So here's Samson now, and here's the danger of his compromise. The first danger is that he is surrounded by the enemy. If you go to a rough place, you're going to be surrounded by the enemy. They were going to ensure that there was no way for Samson to escape. Kind of reminds me of a, a verse I read in Psalms, in Psalm 40 and verse 12, where the psalmist cries out and he says, For innumerable evils have compassed me about. Innumerable, uncountable evils have compassed me about. My iniquities have taken hold upon me so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of mine head. Therefore, my heart faileth me. The psalmist says, I'm so deep in this sin, I can't even see my way through. Those who seek worldly pleasures, which is what Samson was doing, you're walking into an ambush. Sin is deceitful. Sin promises freedom and fun, enjoyment, but in reality, it brings, at the end result, bondage and sorrow. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. A command to us, it says, But exhort one another daily, Christian. Exhort one another daily. If you know somebody's struggling, call them. Take them out to dinner. Exhort them. Do everything you can. Exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin deceives. First, sin deceives. And then it entangles until finally... It is controlling you again. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty. Stand fast in the liberty doesn't mean to say, I've got Christian liberty and I can go to a rough place. Stand fast in the liberty means saying no to the temptation to go to the rough place. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Don't follow Samson's footsteps. Notice something else. Not only was he surrounded, but the enemy was waiting for him. They're waiting for Samson. He's in great danger, and he, he, he doesn't even realize it at the point, but they're waiting for him. They sought to destroy him, to destroy him when he was least prepared for the fight, when he least expected it. You probably heard people say, when you least expect it, expect it. Right? I don't know how you could do that when you least expect it. Anyway. When Samson least expected, least prepared to fight, that's when they were going to get him. And that, by the way, is what the devil seeks to do to you. He wants you to get comfortable in your sin. He wants you to enjoy it so that he can destroy you before you even know what's happening. The enemy thought that Samson was going to be comfortable in his sin. They thought that in the morning, when he least expected it, they could destroy him when he was slumbering in his false sense of security. And let me say something here. I know that a good deal of Christians today are in Samson's condition. They're in a false sense of security. They've had sin in their life that's basically been driving their decisions, controlling what they think and how they think and where they go. And they've been living a mediocre Christian life for so long They've gotten comfortable there, they've gotten satisfied there, and they don't even realize that the devil is, is destroying them. They can't even see it. It's like the guy, who, the guy who's a drunkard who doesn't realize that drink after drink he is destroying his life. Or the druggie who 
each time he partakes of his, his cheap thrill, doesn't realize he's killing himself, destroying himself. Sin, whatever your favorite sin is, is destroying you. It is destroying you. And if you don't get it out of your life, it's going to totally and completely ruin you before it's all done. The devil doesn't mind if you're comfortable. He wants you to be comfortable. If you want to float down the river of compromise in your little boat there, he's going to, you know, kind of fluff up your pillow and let you be comfortable. He'll help you sleep. Christian, the devil wants you to sleep. Paul wrote this. He says, Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee life. That's what God wants from us. He doesn't want us comfortable in our sin. The devil does. He wants you to feel safe. He wants you to feel secure. And then, while you're slumbering in your sinful, lukewarm condition, the devil is going to get you. He's going to ruin your life. Now let's move on to the third point. Judges chapter 16 and verse 3. And Samson lay till midnight, and arose at midnight. Oh, that's interesting. Doesn't even wait till morning. He arose at midnight took the doors of the gates of the city and the two posts and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of a hill that is before Hebron. There's a lot in this verse. First thing I want you to notice is that Samson arose at midnight. Why did he arise at midnight? Why did he get up in the middle of the night and rush out? I don't know, I thought about that, and several thoughts came to my mind. First of all, maybe his conscience was bothering him. After 20 years of doing it right, and now suddenly he fell into sin, maybe his conscience was bothering him. Has that ever happened to you, where you sinned and suddenly felt so terrible about it? Maybe that's what's going on in Samson's life. Well, sin was pleasurable for the season, but now that it's over, he feels bad. Maybe that's what's going on. Maybe he's restless because of his sin, and it's bothering him. Maybe there's no peace in his heart because of his sin. That, by the way, is a Bible principle. The book of Isaiah tells us that in two places, and one of them in Isaiah 57 and verse 21. It says, There is no peace, my God, saith my God, to the wicked. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. So if you want to live in wickedness, you're not going to have peace. Are you struggling right now? Are you feeling a lack of peace in your life? You need to check and see if the problem is you. Because it may very well be Samson got what he wanted. He went down to Gaza. He saw there in Harlot, and he went in unto her. He got what he wanted, but now he's not happy. He's not at rest. He can't sleep. Maybe Samson had now become distressed over his sin. I can't believe I did this. What was I doing? What was I thinking? Have you ever felt that way? As a Christian, sometimes I do something. I know this never happens to you, but it happens to me sometimes, okay? Where I'll do something, I know it's wrong, and then I look at myself and I say, I can't believe you did that. You're supposed to be a child of God. What did you do that for? That was so, that was so bad. That was so, and I get disgusted with what I did. And then, and this doesn't happen to you, but it happens to me. I look at myself and I say, and if I don't do it, somebody else might point it out to me, so I do it to myself. And you call yourself a preacher. And look what you did. You call yourself a man of God, and look what you did. I know maybe you don't experience that part of it, but the other part you probably get, the part where you look at yourself and say, I can't believe I did that. As a child of God, I have no, I have, I have no business in Gaza. As a child of God, I have no business partaking of, of the pleasures of sin for a season. Now look at me. Look what I did. Maybe Samson was disgusted and couldn't stand the thought of just being there for one more minute. Maybe he just had to get out of there. It was bothering him so much. Maybe he was dis distressed by his sin and he had to get out of there. But whatever the reason, here's what we know. Samson's not at peace. Samson's not sleeping. He's not at rest. Christian, are you experiencing the peace of real fellowship with your Savior right now? Samson was not able to rest in peace. You know the world, the world thinks very highly of its entertainment. You ever thought, you ever noticed that? They think so highly of its entertainment. In this case, they thought that this harlot was going to keep him preoccupied all night. 
you know, the world might think highly of their entertainment, but I don't think we should. I think we should be very careful with what the world says is fun. Samson is not comfortable. And I believe that the Holy Spirit of God would not let him sleep. I believe that had Samson slept the next morning, he might have been killed. Oh yeah, he was strong, but he wasn't Superman. I mean, bullets could still stop him, you know. I, I know they didn't have bullets in those days, but you get the point, right? But he can't sleep, and I think the Holy Spirit kept him awake. Had he slept, he probably would have died. Now here's another application I'd like to make here. If you can get comfortable in your sin, if you can feel at rest, if you will, in your sin, you are in great danger. If you can make excuses for your actions and act like everything is fine with you, when you know that they're really not fine, but you pretend that they are, and you can kind of somehow sear your conscience or kind of make yourself feel better about what you're doing, you know, maybe point to somebody else and say, look what they're doing. I'm not as bad as them. If you can somehow get comfortable in your lukewarm condition, you're in great danger. Because had Samson slept till morning, he was going to die. And if you continue sleeping in your sin, the devil's going to destroy your life. You are in great danger if you get comfortable with your sin. Notice this. Samson, what does he do? He gets up at midnight and he broke out of Gaza... And he ran away from it. He left the rough place. Anybody ever heard of Josephus? Josephus was a, he was a, a Jewish historian. He, he wrote uh, in, uh, I think it was the first century or second century. He wrote a long time ago anyway. Anyway, he writes this. He records this. Samson rushed out and finding the door secured, by the power of God, he took the doors, the doorposts, and the bars with him. Now, if Josephus is right, if Samson tore the doors off by the power of God, then there must have been some time for repentance there. Maybe when he rushed out of that room and was rushing out of the city, somewhere along the way he repented because the power of God is restored in his life. And he rips the doors off. Deliverance by the power of God can only come when there has been contrition in your heart. So if you find yourself in a bad situation right now, and you're looking and you know that you are in that situation because you've been sinning, get it right, then the power of God can be restored in your life and you again can know and experience the freedom that's in Christ. This is what Samson does. He carries those doors. The Bible tells us that he carried the doors. Look at verse 3. He took the doors of the gate of the city, the two posts, and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of a hill that is before Hebron. So he carries them all the way over to a hill that's right there beside this place called Hebron. He carries those doors from Gaza to Hebron a distance of 20 miles. Um, for those of you that think in kilometers, that's 32 kilometers. That's quite a ways. He carries those doors. That's the distance from, from, uh, from right here to Ixon or here to Chunju or whatever. That's a long way to carry these doors. I couldn't do that, you know, just carrying a, um, you know, a backpack full of, of uh, you know, Bibles or something. But he does it with these huge doors. That's the power of God. That's why Josephus said that. 20 miles. No more doors on their city. And, and those were not doors like that door. You can see that door, right? I couldn't carry that door one mile, much less 20. But it's not that kind of door. No, these are the doors to the city. These doors would have been too big for any single man to carry. Usually it took more than one to open. But he rips them off, bars and all. That requires the strength of God. Samson carries these doors. 20 miles. I wonder why he didn't just break the doors off the hinges and run away. You ever wonder that? Why did he just knock the doors off and keep on going? I don't know. Maybe he was sending the enemy a clear sign. A signal that God was protecting him now and he was not going to be trapped by the enemy. That they were not going to be able to repeat that trap in his life ever again. The doors totally ripped off the city. What does he do? Samson leaves now a gaping hole in the city wall. And I, I want to make an application here. Because this is exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. 
The doors are gone, never to be closed again. This is a picture of our freedom through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He tore a hole in death that can never be closed again. You and I can walk out anytime we want. We're free. Free by the power of God. Sin might be able to entangle us, but sin can never ever captive us or take us captive again. We are never going to be captives to sin again. If we walk in the power of God and the freedom of Christ, we can be free. Sin is not my master. We are now walking in the newness of life. So what does Samson do? He goes to Hebron. Why Hebron? Well, Hebron was a place that symbolized in the Jewish mind a place of alliance with God. Samson left that rough place, Gaza, and he went to a hill which is before Hebron. A place that symbolized alliance or fellowship, if you will, with God. In fact, the name Hebron means association or place of alliance. It was a place full of history to the Jew. It was Hebron early in the story of Abraham where the Bible says that Abraham dwelt in the plains of Mamre, which is Hebron. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 13 and verse 18. That's where Abraham dwelt by Hebron. In Joshua chapter 14, we learn that Caleb, who is the son of Jephunneh, kicked the giants. The, the giants had Hebron. They were in Hebron. And Caleb says, I'll go take care of that problem. So he kicks the giants out of Hebron and took it for his possession. This is a historical place. Hebron was also one of the cities that was assigned to the Levites. Now, this is an important point. Look in Joshua chapter 21. Turn to Joshua 21, verses 11 through 13. Joshua chapter 21, verses 11 through 13. And here's what the scriptures say. And they gave them the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which city is Hebron, in the hill country of Judah, with the suburbs thereof round about it. But the fields of the city and the villages thereof gave they to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, for his possession. Thus they gave to the children of Aaron the priest, Hebron with her suburbs, to be a city of refuge for the slayer, and Libna with her suburbs. So Hebron was a city of refuge. Now you read in the Old Testament, you're going to find that there were several cities, well, six cities of refuge. And this is the best point. Hebron is a city of of refuge. We learn back in Joshua chapter 20, verses 5 through 7, about the city of refuge. It says, If the avenger of blood pursue after him, then they shall not deliver the slayer up into his hand, because he smote his neighbor unwittingly and hated him not before time. And he shall dwell in that city, the city of refuge, until he stand before the congregation for judgment, and until the death of the high priest that shall be in those days. Then shall the slayer return and come unto his own city and unto his own house, unto the city from whence he fled. And they appointed Kadesh in, Gilead, in Galilee, in Mount Naphtali, and Shechem in Mount Ephraim, and Kirjath Arba, which is Hebron, in the mountain of Judah. So Hebron became a city of refuge. Now what exactly was a city of refuge? Well, it was a place where a man could go to be safe from the avenger of blood. If he had accidentally killed somebody and he didn't do it because he hated him maybe he just you know accidentally hit him in the car and killed him or, or whatever the situation it was an accidental death and after that accidental death he could flee from the avenger of blood which would be a close family member of the one who was killed who had legal rights under the law to come and find you and execute judgment upon you you could flee to the city of ref refuge and then after the death of the high priest, Christian, who's your high priest? Hello, anybody out there? Who's your high priest, Christian? Jesus Christ, my great high priest. After the death of the high priest, then this man who fled to the city of refuge could be free to return home without fear of punishment. Now, believer, Jesus is your high priest. His death on the cross made it possible for us to return home, if you will, to the Father. Because He died for us and tore a hole in death that can never be closed, we now have a city of refuge we can flee to, and we can go home without fear of punishment. All of that provided for us 
in Christ. Now here's the conclusion. Some of us are just like Samson. And this is the spot where all the men are going, yeah, man, just like Samson. Uh, that outward focus without the inward focus <coughs> is going to get you in a whole lot of trouble. And here's what I know. I know that no matter who you are, when you get old, your muscles are going to sag and your hair, if you still have it, is going to turn gray. And your face is still going to get wrinkles. And you're probably going to get that little middle-aged hump if you're a guy. I'm just going to talk about the guys. I'm going to talk about the girls. I'll get you in big trouble. I'll leave the girls alone. <laughs> we guys, we get that, you know. We get that middle age. We get what we call furniture disease. You ever heard of furniture disease? It's where your chest has done falling down into your drawers. It's called furniture disease. That's going to happen to you guys. Every one of you. No matter how macho you may think you are now. <clears throat> no matter how macho we may be now. It's going to happen. So don't put the focus on the outside. The Bible says bodily <laughs> exercise profiteth a little. Right? Yeah, there's a little profit to going to gym. No question about it. You, you know, you'll be healthier. And you'll feel better. I got that. And you'll be more able to do things, including serving the Lord. I agree. I understand. I try to do that myself. I try to, I try to take care of my health as best as I can myself. But if that's your focus, if you think that that is what's going to get you through in life, you're sadly mistaken. I don't know very many professional athletes that are still playing at the age of 40 unless it's golf. I really don't call that much of a sport, actually. But you get the point. You're going to lose it physically. So you better put the focus on that which is spiritual. You better be trying to build yourself up spiritually. Because if you're going to act and think like Samson, then you're going to have the problems that Samson had. We, we walk with God in victory. And some of us, like Samson, walk with God in victory for a while. And then we go right back into our weaknesses and we fall back into our sins. And it's just like our story the devil has now surrounded us and wants to destroy our lives. But God, if you'll turn to him, can give you deliverance. <clears throat> Read the book of Judges six times. God is very, very patient with us. I'm not saying that you ought to push that patience. But I am saying if that's your state now, you can fix it. All you need to do is turn to the Lord. What kind of sins have you been entangled with? What kind of problems have come into your life? Well, it doesn't matter. It could be really big if it was the kind of thing that anybody knew about. It would just destroy your reputation totally. Or it could be something really small where a lot of Christians would look at that and say, ah, that's no big deal. Everybody does that. But you're convicted. You feel guilty because the Holy Spirit's working in your life. It doesn't matter what the sin is. All you have to do is confess it to the Lord today. And it can be taken care of. What kind of rough place, Christian, have you found yourself living in or frequenting? What kind of rough place, what kind of place of sin have you found yourself in? You don't have to stay there. You don't have to stay there, Christian. As, as a child of God, the Lord wants you to come home like the prodigal. To see yourself wallowing in the mud with the pigs. Spiritually starving not able to find anything in this world to satisfy you. If you want to be satisfied, all you need to do is return to the Father who puts on the fatted lamb. Think about that for a moment. <coughs> Would you leave that rough place of sin this morning? Christ was risen from the dead, not, not just to save you from the penalty of your sins, but also to give you freedom from the power of sin. Let's all stand. Every hand out, every eye closed. Christ not only delivers from sin, but also gives victory to walk in that newness of life. Gives victory over the enemy as well. And I know some of you here need that victory. You found yourself uncomfortable? Amen. The Holy Spirit's been working. Restless? Amen. The Holy Spirit has been working. In sorrow? 
in despair. God doesn't want you to live there. He wants you to leave Gaza. He wants to set you free. All you need to do is flee to Hebron, flee to the city of refuge, where you have a great high priest who will plead your cause. As the piano begins to play, if God has spoken to you, won't you come? some of you that you need to just get your life straight. I, I wish I could. I, I wish I could just go out and grab you sometimes and just shake you and say, hey, hey, can't you see? Don't you know what's going on? It's not about me. It's not about the haven. It's about you. We're going to have one more verse in a moment. But I want to urge you, if you are out of fellowship with God and you know it, don't go one more hour like that. As the piano plays again, one more stanza. If God has spoken to you, would you come? Father, thank you. 